This week on Vaticano, discover the story of Luigi and Maria Beltrame Quattrocchi, the patron saints of the upcoming World Meeting of Families in Rome. Join us at the Topology of Intelligence Conference to discover the Church's efforts in the field of artificial intelligence. And meet Carlota Valenzuela, a Spanish pilgrim walking from Finisterre to Jerusalem. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On Tuesday, May the 31st, at the Holy See Press Office, a letter was presented on behalf of Cardinal Angelo de Donatis, the Vicar General of the Diocese of Rome, that announced that Luigi Beltrame Quattrocchi and Maria Corsini would be the patron saints of the 10th World Meeting of Families that will be taking place this June in Rome. The theme for this year's World Meeting of Families will be family love, a vocation and a path to holiness. Luigi Beltrame Quattrocchi and Maria Corsini's witness as patron saints of the event is well suited as they were the first couple to be beatified together in 2001. According to St. John Paul II, they lived an ordinary life in an extraordinary way. Luigi Beltrame was born in 1880 in Catania, Italy. He spent his early years with his parents and siblings. But in 1889, he went to live with his uncle who had no children and requested custody. Maria Corsini was born in Florence in 1884. Luigi and Maria met in Rome and married on November the 25th, 1905, in the Basilica of St. Mary Major. During the following years, they welcomed four children, Filippo, Stefania, Cesare, and Enriqueta. During World War I, the Beltrame Quattrocchi couple assisted the wounded and families in need. Luigi worked in the Christian revival movement, and Maria wrote books, served as a catechist, was a national counselor for Catholic action, and organized marriage preparation courses, which were a novelty at that time. The children grew up in the faith, with three of the four entering religious life. Filippo, the eldest, became a Benedictine monk. Stefania entered a Benedictine monastery in Milan. Cesare became a Trappist. Luigi and Maria attended daily mass and began a family ministry in Rome with meetings for engaged and married couples and provided financial support for young men who wished to become priests with their house always serving as a meeting point for those who wished to deepen their faith. In 1951, Luigi died of a heart attack. Maria would remain alive for another 14 years during which time she would continue the spiritual journey and service she had undertaken with her husband. A discreet but powerful message. With these words, the Canadian sculptor, Timothy Schmaltz, defined his most recent work of art, presented on Sunday, May the 29th at Rome's Church of San Marcello al Corso. Life Monument is the title of the sculpture that depicts Mary with Jesus still in the womb. It's a clear and evocative image that recalls the theme of life, its defense, and the duty of protecting it. It's the first pro-life sculpture to be installed in Rome a first that the artist wished to emphasize. It's composed almost entirely of bronze with a part in mirrored steel in the area of the womb of the Virgin Mary. Speaking about the meaning of the work, Schmaltz indicated how he wished this to be a silent but determined protest, referring to sculpture as a medium able to show that which must be visibly present in our society, the value and sacredness of life. Two years of work, for a piece that the sculptor defines as providential, considering the current situation in the United States for pro-life issues. Highlighting also the uniqueness of the work, being that there are few statues in the world that depict pregnant women. In September of 2019, on the occasion of the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, Pope Francis and four refugees from different parts of the world inaugurated another sculpture from Timothy Smaltz in St. Peter's Square entitled Angels Unawares. The six meter long work in bronze shows a group of 140 migrants and refugees on a boat, 
a representation that the Pope has defined as a means for remembering all of the evangelical challenges of hospitality. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, bringing you the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. At a consistory on August 27th, Pope Francis will create 21 new cardinals, including San Diego Bishop Robert Walter McElroy and Arthur Roche, Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Of the new cardinals, a total of 16 will be able to participate in the election of the new pope in the event of a conclave, since they are still under 80 years old. Cardinal Angelo Sodano, former Vatican diplomat and retired Secretary of State, died on May 27th at the age of 94. Sodano led the curial office for 15 years under both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church claimed its full self-sufficiency and independence, distancing itself further from Russian Orthodoxy. The announcement comes during the third month of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has been prominently supported by Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. Pope Francis said that his heart was broken by the killing of at least 19 children and two adults at an elementary school in Texas. Speaking at the end of his general audience in St. Peter's Square, he also emphasized that it is time to say enough to the indiscriminate trafficking of weapons. In a video message, Pope Francis encouraged the Pontifical Commission for Latin America to continue its mission at the service of the Church in Latin America and of Hispanic ministry in the United States and Canada. The Pontiff indicated that his institution is an instance of service which is justified by the peculiar identity and fraternity that the nations of Latin America live. The Pope's African trip will begin July 2nd in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and end July 7th in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. This will be Pope Francis' third visit to Sub-Saharan Africa and also the first papal visit to South Sudan, which became independent in 2011. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. We're here in the heart of Rome at a conference covering the topic of intelligence, human intelligence, animal intelligence, and artificial intelligence. The World Temple and Charity Foundation brought together scientists from very different backgrounds, including theology, mathematics, engineering, to discuss intelligence. To find out where we stand today on the topic of artificial intelligence, follow me, let's find out. The conference Topology of Intelligence brought together church and science to shed light on the newest scientific developments and the necessity of keeping humans in the loop. Artificial intelligence. Marta Bertolasso is one of the main organizers of the conference and professor of philosophy of science and human development at the Campus Biomedico University of Rome. She's a well-renowned expert on artificial intelligence. I think that uh, we are uh, in, in a good moment because uh, there is a question around about these topics. To her, the challenge with artificial intelligence is not so much the technological possibilities, but how we will be able to use them to build new worlds and environments still worthwhile to live in. She's fairly optimistic that new developments will have a positive impact on the future of mankind. This optimism is shared by Andrew Saracen, the president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation that made the conference possible. He's convinced that we should never be afraid of the future. I think that um, we were rem reminded today that, that um, within the Christian tradition, within the Catholic tradition, there's this sense of openness of history, that we are co-creators of the future with the divine. And, uh, and, and church is a way uh, to, to, to achieve that co-creation. And so, um, you know, similarly with the progress in technology that, um, you know, it reveals so much about 
the world. It provides an opportunity for us to, to amplify some of our special characteristics. Um, so I'm tremendously optimistic about the application of science and technology, the development of artificial intelligence, if we retain our fundamental values of the pursuit of truth, the dignity of the person. The conference was organized in three parts, expressing, defining, and understanding intelligence. First, the audience listened to the insights of Andrew Barron, a neuroethologist at the Macquarie University, explaining how honeybees display a certain kind of intelligent behavior in their flight patterns and navigation decisions. In the second panel, theologian and physicist Giulio Maspero discussed with theoretical physicist Mario Razzetti why it might prove difficult to measure general artificial intelligence, even though we're seeing some forms of non-human intelligence already today, not least in the flight or dance of the honeybees. What we have not seen so far is self-referential or self-aware artificial intelligence, a fact that the third panel highlighted. It might still take some time, if ever, that computers will be smart enough to be self-aware. However, computers will master certain skills or arts, such as medicine, law, or mathematics, on an equal level and eventually better than humans. These developments have an impact on our view of the human person, on human rights, and our self-understanding. The church uh, definitely is uh, uh, interested in, uh, in intelligence because it is a human, right? So in, the church is always very much interested in all the aspects and dimensions of uh, human life. And in this case, uh, the very notion of intelligence is very much related uh, with uh, um, behaviors, dynamics, uh, challenges. We have in our daily life, in our professional works environments, in science, in technology, more and more. I think, for example, as you said, artificial intelligence. So, uh, and the, the church is never afraid, I would say, of challenges, of new challenges arising from human life. The conference aims to bring together scientists, faith leaders, and theologians, as well as philosophers, and thus bridging the gap between two communities, those of faith and those of empirical science. Saracen believes that bringing together diverse groups of experts could help solve great challenges to mankind, such as poverty, conflicts, or artificial intelligence. I think what's so important about retaining the human perspective, and, and also an understanding of the human person, that comes from um, uh, theology and philosophy is, is fundamental dignity um, that is located within humanity, not to outsource those decisions to uh, algorithms or machines and to retain the decision-making authority with people uh, because it is people that have fundamentally the moral authority to, um, to act in the world. As we can see, the church is very much involved in the scientific discourse on artificial intelligence. And it's good that it is, because it has a lot to offer when it comes to the notions of morality, theology, and ultimately truth. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser. Imagine you could take a year off, and imagine that during that year you would walk 6,000 kilometers through 12 countries, joining Finisterra, which means the ends of the earth, located on the Spanish Galician coast, to Jerusalem, symbolizing the origin of everything. Meet Carlota Valenzuela, a 29-year-old Spanish pilgrim from Granada, making just that journey, carrying just a map and a 13-pound backpack. She began on January the 2nd, 2022, leaving behind a job, family, and friends in the hopes of arriving in Jerusalem in time for Christmas. Now five months into her journey, and having arrived in Rome, we asked her how this journey began. Here I had very clear, and I felt that God was asking me, but whom are you looking for? And I said, Jesus. 
And he answered me, and where are you going to look for him? And I thought of Jerusalem. And at that moment, I felt that I had to make a pilgrimage on foot to Jerusalem. And then the decision of where to start was a little bit more on my own. That was me thinking that it made sense to leave from Finisterre to make a journey from the end to what I consider to be the beginning. Most of us would be nervous about leaving behind a stable job and the safety and hustle and bustle of our daily routines. But not Carlota. We asked her how difficult that decision was for her to make. It was not really a difficult decision to make because I think that when you feel so clearly that this is what God has put in you, at least in my case it was not a big resignation because it was so beautiful what I was feeling and I felt so much peace and so much joy that at no time I said, my God, where am I going? But I really felt that it was what I had to do. Having arrived at almost the halfway mark on her journey to Jerusalem, we asked Carlota to describe what the last five months have felt like. Regalo gift. I feel that what God does every day is to give me a gift, giving me many encounters, many experiences, giving me the gift of constant learning, and I feel like every day I don't deserve anything that is happening. But in the end I don't have to deserve it, I have to live it. We ask Carlota to share with us what lessons she feels that she's learned so far on her journey. The lesson of abandonment, that I can trust in God because He always has everything in His hands, and that when I don't trust and I have fears, worries, when I get into a loop of where I'm going to sleep, what I'm going to eat, maybe I arrive and there's nothing, maybe something happens to me, maybe I physically can't, when I get into that wheel of worry and anxiety, the only thing I'm doing is separating myself from God and telling Him, I don't trust you. When in reality, he shows me every day that I have more than a thousand reasons to be able to trust him. While in Rome, Carlota has had the opportunity to visit the tomb of her favorite saint, Peter. We asked her why Saint Peter is her favorite saint. I think of Peter who was really a disaster who was a person who had many defects and who stumbled a lot, and that Jesus loved him so much and gave him this responsibility and this important role, it makes me calm down and think that I don't have to be perfect. I have to let myself go. Peter appears a lot while I'm on pilgrimage. I think about him a lot. And when I arrived a couple of days ago at St. Peter's Square, I felt like I was coming to see him, like coming to visit St. Peter and tell him, I'm the same as you. And if God trusted you so much, what will he not give me if he gave you so much too? While in Rome, she'll also have the opportunity to meet the successor of Peter. I would really love to ask him to bless this pilgrimage so that through me, God can also bless others. For me to be an instrument beyond in smallness and in this trip, that this may serve not only for me, but for others as well. The young pilgrim explained that after these five months on the road, she already feels somewhat changed. A theme that runs through her pilgrimage is the idea that you only have one life and have the courage to respond to what God puts in your heart. First is that they have the courage to understand what God has put inside their heart, because God puts something different in everyone. Many times I fall into the error of thinking that there is a path to success that there is a way. But in the end, God has created each one of us with our name, with our face, and He has looked at each one of us in a personal way. I would invite people who have the courage to investigate a little inside, to say, what is happening to me? What has God put inside me? And on that path of discovery, when they begin to glimpse where things are going, then they should set out on their way. Carlota's intention is to be in the Holy Land for Christmas. We asked her what she hopes to tell the Lord once she arrives. I will tell him what I've been telling him since I started, that here I am, so that he may do his will in me. ¿Te viene? Sígueme.
As every year, the church celebrates the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. A solemnity established by Pope Urban IV more than 700 years ago. It all began in the 13th century, when a German priest, tormented by his doubts about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, decided to make a pilgrimage to Rome to pray at the tombs of the apostles Peter and Paul. On his return journey, the priest wanted to stop in a small town in central Italy called Bolsena. While celebrating Mass in the church dedicated to St. Catherine, something extraordinary happened. At the moment of the consecration, while raising the host over the chalice, the priest saw that the particle began to bleed. The blood began to fall on the corporal and on the other linen cloths on the altar. Frightened, the priest didn't have the courage to go on and hastily took the host, the chalice, the corporal and all the other objects that had been stained by the blood and ran to the sacristy, placing everything inside the tabernacle. It was only later that the priest decided to tell the pontiff, who was in the nearby city of Orvieto at the time. Pope Urban IV ordered the Bishop of Orvieto to bring him the corporal on which the drops of Christ's blood had fallen. The bishop, obeying the Pope, went to Bolsena, took the corporal, and accompanied by a crowd of people, brought the proof of the miracle to the bridge over the Rivocato River, where the Pope was waiting for him, together with cardinals, clerics, religious, and all the people of Orvieto. After these events, on August the 11th, 1264, Pope Urban IV, with the bull Transiturus de Hoc Mundo, established the Feast of Corpus Christi for all of Christendom, setting the day of its celebration on the Thursday of the Octave of Pentecost. In the bull instituting the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Pope also wanted to address St. Juliana of Mont Cornillon, the mystic who for more than 20 years had visions connected with the birth of this feast, a full moon crossed by a band obscuring its center. In the interpretation given by the mystic herself, the moon disc represents the militant church. The bandage that partly hides it means that a feast is missing. God wants its creation, the feast of the very august and very sacred sacrament of the altar. This memory is still preserved today in the majestic Duomo of Orvieto, where the corporal of the so-called Miracle of Bolsena is exposed on the day of the solemnity of Corpus Christi. The historian Luigi Fiumi defined this cathedral as a miracle of art that arose to guard a miracle of faith.